Okay, I think it is recording. And Sebastian, would you mind monitoring the chat? Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have this video available later. If you end up not being able to hear some of the stuff that we're saying, um, then you should be able to watch it later. I'm gonna go ahead and enlarge that. So I wanted to give you guys a little bit of information about essay writing. The purpose of this course is to get to know how to do some close reading and how to talk about what we're reading, um, but also to learn how to write an essay. And kind of in between that is rhetoric. And so we're gonna to touch a little bit on rhetoric uh, today. We're not gonna go into super detail about rhetoric and actually um, there's some stuff about rhetoric that can like muddle uh, the writing process. And I don't want us to get into that habit either. So I'll talk about that when we get to it. But here are some notes on essay composition and the use of rhetoric. Um, so where should you start? How do you write an essay? I know that sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to write essays or to find a place to start. Um, I think Lily ended up going because it got a little bit loud, but we'll get back to her. Um, but sometimes it's hard to find a place to start. Um, it might help to know what an essay is though. Essays are brief works of writing that make a point and attempt to prove that point. The main key word here is point. You're making a point with an essay. Um, and so you need to do whatever you can to make that point. But essays are self-contained environments. Um, so it's really helpful to think of your essay as a fish tank or an aquarium um, and your readers as fish. So as you can see in this aquarium picture that I have here, there's like a, there's a light, there's a filter, there's all kinds of different types of fish, like a diversity of fish. There's little houses in there, little pebbles, plants that are growing out of the pebbles. And all of that contributes to an environment where the fish can thrive. They can not only live, but they can thrive. So think of your essay as an aquarium. If that aquarium is missing, like the plants to help oxygenate the water or uh, the pump. The fish might actually die if it's missing the pump depending on what type of fish they are, or maybe the light is missing. If your fish don't have what they need in that aquarium, then they can't survive in that aquarium. And they're going to leave that aquarium. Maybe they'll leave, they might just die. Um, that's another way of leaving the aquarium. Um, they're going to leave the aquarium to get what they need or because they couldn't get what they need. So if your fish are leaving your aquarium, that's like your readers not reading your essay. And if you have a really important point to make, then you want to keep your fish in that aquarium and you want your fish to not only thrive in that aquarium, but you want your fish to then take that aquarium when they're done with it. They want to rem you want them to remember that aquarium. So give your readers everything that they need so that they don't leave your essay. And sometimes that means that we have to define words that are already defined. Sometimes that means we have to tell about events that we take for granted are uh, really well known to people. So defining what the event was might be absolutely necessary for the environment of your essay. You never know who's going to be reading your essay or uh, who you might need to make that point to. And so um, prepare for anybody to read it. it it's very possible that like maybe your peer review partner came from another country and they didn't know about something that happened in American history that everybody in this country already knows about and that needs to be explained in your essay. If you don't include that in, in your essay, then they're probably going to give you feedback that's going to, you know, point that out, that's going to show that gap. So think about it like an aquarium. If anything's missing, your fish are going to tell you <laughs> because they're going to try to leave. Um, also, don't refer to other texts without like quoting what you need from that text or without directly referencing that text. If you say, go look at page 96 of the dictionary, then that means that your readers are going to put down your essay. People don't like to read in this country. So if they put down your essay, the chances that they'll come back to your essay are very slim, unless they have to. Of course, a lot of the times we make students go back to essays. Um, but in the real world, you write essays to make a point. So you might need to make an, write an essay to a magazine or a scientific journal or something like that because you discovered the cure to cancer. Um, you need them to be able to read that. And if they have to turn away from your essay and read somebody else's essay in order to understand what you're talking about, then your argument's not effective. And so that's a good way. That's what I always think about my, my readers of the fish 
and I need to give them absolutely everything they need, even if I'm coddling them, even if it's maybe a little bit too much, I need to give them everything they need to stay in that aquarium. So the standard American essay, I'm going to refer to the standard American essay. Another way that you'll hear about this is it's the five paragraph essay. Um, when you're in college, it's people like me who are going to be teaching your classes, people who got degrees in English, who got degrees in writing, who studied this extensively. Um, but actually in my classes, I was taught that we should not tell you that there is a set form for essays. We, we get bored by reading those essays. We wanna see creativity. We wanna see people getting excited and passionate and just going with their gut. But the problem is that um, when you're first starting out writing essays, it's not always easy to know how to take off. And especially if you're writing about things that you don't care about. Like if you're writing for, uh, like you have to write an essay for, that was a class, a chemistry class, and you're talking about the reaction between vinegar and baking soda, and you're explaining that reaction. That's a really boring subject, and sometimes it's really hard to think about how you can get creative writing that. So then turn to the default. The default is always a safe one. Um, it really, it's only within the English department. It's only people like me who um, get super excited about extra creative stuff. Your other teachers just want to read convincing arguments or convincing writing, and they want it clear. They want to be able to focus on it. They want to understand what you're writing about. Creativity, they could care less, especially if you're going into business school. In fact, in business school, you do the opposite of uh, what you do in creative writing. In creative writing, you show, you don't tell. But in business school, you just tell. If you show, you're wasting their time, and they won't, they'll put your stuff down. Um, and I can answer any questions about the differences between um, essay writing, creative writing, um, all of that, and business writing, if you, if you have any questions about that. But the standard American essay is a really good default. Um, it's usually a pretty set formula where you have um, an introduction paragraph, you have things reinforcing it, and then you have a conclusion, conclusion paragraph, which I'll uh, talk to you about a little bit more um, in a bit. But it helps American readers maintain focus. Another reason I'm going to refer to this as the standard American essay is because essays exist in other countries and in other languages and they look very different than the way that they do in America. Um, actually in Latin America, an essay uh, looks very different. It's appropriate to write an essay that looks very different where the thesis statement maybe doesn't come at the beginning of the essay, um, maybe comes a little bit later in the essay and is constantly referred back to. Um, maybe goes off on a trail, but always comes back. That's very standard for Spanish language essays. Um, for like Asians, actually, Asian countries, a lot of Asian countries, not just one specific Asian language, a lot of Asian languages and cultures, it's rude to directly state what you're wanting to say. We Americans, we don't care. Like, this is what I think. That's not exactly how other countries work. And so a lot of the times when I've seen um, essays that come from people who are writing from other countries or translating from other languages that are Asian languages, I will see the uh, thesis statement at the very end of the essay, which is not something that I'm used to. Um, as an American reader, I'm very used to this kind of default method of essay writing, which means that I also have default ways of reading. Um, but keep in mind that this isn't the only way to write an essay. You might have peers that are going to give you essays that you have to review that um, maybe they're writing, uh, maybe English isn't their first or second language. Maybe they're writing from another language into English. And some of those syntactical habits are going to follow them, just like your syntactical habits from America are going to follow you if you write in another language as well. So um, standard American essay, I'm going to show you what that looks like. But remember, it's not the only way. And some of your teachers that are English teachers like me might actually encourage you to break out of that. Um, this is just a good default. I don't want you to assume that this is the only right way. Um, so this is the form for the standard American essay, which I mentioned just a second ago. It usually starts with the introduction paragraph that has a thesis statement somewhere in it. Um, usually that introduction paragraph will start with a hook. The very first sentence asks a good question or there's a quote. Usually people don't pull off those quotes very effectively though, I do have to say that. Um, usually there's something at the beginning of the essay that gets people to read, that gets those fish into that aquarium. Um, and so you want to hook people in with your introduction paragraph and at some point in there, you want to tell them what this essay is about. Americans need to know right off the bat, what's the point of all of this? Otherwise, we're gone. Um, and that's just our habits of reading. 
The body paragraphs will then use evidence and use other claims to reinforce the main points that you outlined in your thesis statement. Um, usually the, the standard American essay has three body paragraphs that reinforce this. Um, you can have any number of paragraphs in between. The point is that they're accurately uh, structured according to grammar and syntax rules in English um, and that they effectively reinforce your argument. And then a conclusion paragraph needs to revisit your thesis statement. It cannot directly repeat your thesis statement. Even if you just rearrange the words, it really loses, loses your audience if you directly repeat the thesis statement. They then just suddenly don't take your argument very seriously. But if you just rearrange those words, your audience is like, oh yeah, that is a really good point after you've made all those arguments to reinforce it. It reminds your audience why they are reading your essay because we have a short attention span in this country. We, re we read bullet points, headlines, and captions. We barely ever read the stuff in between, or at least I, as somebody who studies English and likes to read, I don't read that way. I don't read long bodies of text if I can help it. Um, so make it easy on your audience. Remind them why they made it to the end of this essay. And what's really helpful, what a really effective essay does, is it allows the audience to think about the argument and to continue agreeing with and considering the argument after leaving the essay. And a good way to do that is to open up the subject with your very last statement or last couple of statements um, that causes your audience to consider your argument a little bit further after they leave. I will almost always end my essays, and I'll, you'll see this in my suggestions probably, I will almost always end my essays with a perhaps if then statement. Um, so perhaps if the Mexicans hadn't caught smallpox and died at such a large extent, they would have won uh, the war against the Spaniards during the conquest. That opens it up for the audience. If they wanted to prove me wrong, they're still thinking about my argument. Um, if the audience wants to then uh, actually argue my point further and go and argue with their friends, then I've made a successful argument. Um, I'm opening it up for that audience member to consider and maybe they'll write my sequel for me. Um, that's ideal is for your audience to take your essay with them after they leave it, literally. Why is the standard American essay form effective? Like I mentioned, we have very short attention spans in this country and we really don't like to read. And outline, outlining your main points first directly informs us of your overall point and argument Outlining these at the end of your essay reminds us why we're reading it and it can actually reinforce the initial argument, the initial point that you made, especially if you reword it effectively. How do I write an essay? Um, my theory is if you can write one sentence, then you can write an effective essay and that's your thesis statement. So usually with a thesis statement, and this may be helpful if you can even like copy and paste this, I'll share this with you when I'm done and actually I, I'm gonna, um, share more stuff with you when I'm done as well. Um, if you can remember that a thesis statement will always have these three components. What is the topic or issue if you're making an argument? Um, what is the point that you want to make about it? And why are you making that point? Um, all of those things need to be in your thesis statement. A lot of the times I'll see all of those points scattered throughout an essay when I first start getting essays from 100 level students. Gradually, they'll start working that down to just the introduction paragraph. Maybe it'll be scattered throughout the introduction. Um, usually the thesis statement is in the essay, but it may not be put together in a sentence. And so if you remember, even if you go through, you write your essay and you're like, oh, I forgot that thesis statement. Just go back. What is your topic? I, sometimes it helps me when I'm helping you guys form your thesis statements to go into your essay and underline what your essay is about. What are the points that you're actually trying to make with your essay, which I'm usually able to find. Um, so just underline those and make sure you talk about them in a sentence, a single sentence at the beginning of your essay. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about how to use this statement to outline your entire essay in a second. Um, but your thesis statement needs to have all three of these. Please remember that because that's really important. If it doesn't have all three of these, then it's not effectively outlining your argument. Um, actually, most uh, effective thesis statements are written after the entire essay is over and the author has had a chance to go back and figure out, answer all these questions for themselves and then put them together in a sentence. And so um, you don't have to just write the sentence first, but if you can, it's a very effective way to outline your essay. So. 
I am going to follow this link and show you guys a little trick. So this um, actually used to be from a lesson I would teach the Upward Bound students from Tacoma and Clover Park when I was working with their programs. Um, back when the SAT actually required a real essay to be written in 20 minutes. Um, it's hard to write an essay in 20 minutes. At no point in college, unless you're taking a test, are you going to be asked to write a thorough good essay in 20 minutes. But for the SAT, they were asking that. And when I was a student, they were asking that as well. Um, so if you need to quickly develop a specific thesis statement and use it to create an outline, here's a really good way to do that. And actually it can make it to where you can write a rough draft really quickly that you can get good focused feedback on. Um, like I said, figure out what is the topic or the issue, what is your position on this issue uh, and why. And you see that I color coded these different things. So here's like a rough outline there. I'm not gonna go over it, um, but I came up with a topic. The traditional A through F grading scale does not adequately measure students' academic abilities because grades reflect arbitrary criteria and only demonstrate the success of students who learn by memorizing information. So I have in the green, I have the topic or the issue, the traditional A through F grading scale. That's what I'm gonna write about today. And for the SAT, it used to be argumentative essays, but it could just easily, just as easily be a topic. The ancient Greeks. <laughs> um, the blue is the position that we're taking on this issue. The A through F grading scale does not adequately measure students' academic abilities. That's my opinion. That's my position on this issue. Obviously, that's not necessarily a fact. Um, I'm going to be making uh, points so that you think of it more as a fact later. Why do I think of that? Uh, because grades reflect arbitrary criteria and only demonstrate the success of students who learn by memorizing information. So the why is usually where your evidence comes in. This is what you're gonna be arguing a little bit more in detail um, in your essay, and this is what you're going to be um, really using to reinforce the main point that you're making, which is here in the blue. Um, but as you can see, you may more or less have a, an outline established. So as you can see, your thesis is your topic plus your main point. Um, take your points that you have, which like I said, are gonna be reflected in the yellow, the um, evidence that you're gonna be using and write a paragraph for, for that stuff. So the first point that you're making, um, because grades reflect arbitrary, arbitrary criteria, you're gonna need a paragraph about that. Um, because they only demonstrate the success of students who learn by memorizing information, you're going to need a paragraph about that. Um, you probably would also need a paragraph explaining the context for it. So you have three paragraphs already. Context for the whole situation, point one, point two, and then you have your conclusion recap. So to clarify this, since that was probably very confusing, here's paragraph one, here's paragraph two, here's paragraph three, Here's paragraph four. And like I said, if you want the five, five paragraph, then right here, you just need to talk about context, right? Um, and then you have a third paragraph in the body, but that's not necessary for this essay, um, especially since this was going to be a 20 minute essay for the SAT. So hopefully this is helpful. I'm gonna share this with you. Um, so you'll be able to see it in more detail and see the examples that I have. Um, but I can always help you with directly with your assignments too, um, when you have things like that. So I'm going to have to re present that. There we go. One thing that's really important to keep in mind is that you cannot write unless you can read. Um, the whole point of writing an essay is so that somebody will read it and will agree with the points that you're making, will agree with your argument. Um, and so it's really important to have somebody read your essay. We cannot read our work objectively. We're too close to it. If you put it down and then wait three years and then come back to it, you might be able to talk about it objectively or to look at it objectively. And but what I mean by that is as if somebody else wrote it. Um, if you do that, then you might be able to give yourself good feedback, but it's actually 
usually pretty difficult to do that. Usually we're emotionally connected. We assume that people know what's going on in our heads and we will just put that directly in our essays. And so most of the time people can't give themselves feedback. They're not gonna know how their essay will be read unless they have somebody else read it, which is why you need to have your friends read your essays before you turn them into your instructors, especially in college. In college, they pretty much expect you, especially at Evergreen, they're not even gonna tell you to do this. They expect you to have somebody else read your essay before you submit it. You submit final drafts only to your instructors most of the time. Um, and they do expect you to have somebody look at it first. Really cool resource to help with this is the Writing Center. If you're ever um, stuck, the Writing Center can help you with that. Or if you just need somebody to tell you how your essay sounds, um, sometimes I need to know if I even talked about the top main topic I uh, wanted to make in a way that's digestible, because I can be a bit wordy if you can't tell. Um, and so the Writing Center can help a lot. Um, Using what people tell you based off of how they read your work, you can revise based off of those suggestions, um, which will make a more powerful point, which will make a more powerful argument. Um, and that'll better engage and convince your audience. That's the whole point of this, right? So I need to go over a few habits that uh, high school kind of ingrains in us that we need to shed by the time we go off to college in order to be successful. So um, I'm not meaning to call anybody out by uh, talking about any of these habits, but they're habits that I see all the time as students are coming from high school entering college. Um, and if you break these habits from high school, then you're more likely to receive uh, constructive feedback about content rather than like grammar and style and stuff like that. Because um, grammar there's no like text, uh, there are textbooks actually, but they're impossible to read. Um, there's no like definitive way of handling English grammar because it is an amalgamation of multiple different languages and we've adopted syntax and grammar rules from all of those different languages. So actually Spanish is a really good example. I learned learning Spanish that always the vowels are going to make the same sound always that helps me when i'm pronouncing spanish speakers names um always the vowels are going to make the same sounds the consonants i have trouble with still but the vowels will make the same sounds english i can't give you a rule like that i really can't um and so there are lots of habits that we just get into based off of um what we're saying um our casual language and i'll talk a little bit more about that um that we take into our writing I'm glad the I'm glad the feedback was helpful. Um, so we'll go to the next slide really quick. The first thing that comes up always, always, always when I get essays from uh, students coming from high school into college and actually while I'm helping students who are in high school is the long paragraph. Somewhere in there the teachers aren't telling you when you need to have paragraphs and when you don't need to have paragraphs. So let me just tell you, you always have paragraphs in your writing. Always, always, always. Um, and as you're getting used to like forming complete sentences and learning the structure of language and how to appropriately use grammar and stuff, sometimes it's a headache to teach people how to break things into paragraphs. So basically, here are two rules that you can kind of follow that are pretty safe when it comes to breaking things into different paragraphs. Every time you change subject, every time your topic changes, and every time you change tense. Um, and that's with essay writing. If you're doing creative writing, um, every time you have a new line of dialogue or new, a new line of dialogue spoken by a different person is another rule. So if you are quoting people, say you want to quote both Riva and Sebastian in an essay that you're writing, Mundo, then you say, Riva said, and then you put my quote there. And if Sebastian replied to that, you don't put it in the same paragraph. That's a brand new paragraph. So sometimes paragraphs are really, really short, um, especially in creative writing. And that's why sometimes our essay, our quick reading rules don't work for those uh, novels and creative pieces. Because sometimes they have a lot of dialogue that are just one line paragraphs that you have to read in order to understand what's going on. Um, but for essays, two pretty easy rules. Every time you switch subject, every time you switch tense. Um, casual speech and writing. So this comes from a few different directions for uh, casual speech. I will see this 
most commonly because uh, novel writing, uh, creative writing, you're able to use more casual speech, you're able to use sentence, sentence fragments in order to, to creatively move your work forward, especially poetry. You don't even have to use grammar in poetry. Um, ask Sebastian, none of mine makes any sense. Um, <laughs> but casual speech, I will usually see because people will read novels and they will assume that you can take the way that you write in novels and put it into essay writing. And to a degree you can, um, but a lot of that includes sentence fragments that don't make any sense. You're taking for granted what's missing from the sentence that your audience understands that and that's gonna cause the fish to leave the aquarium. Um, there are other habits like uh, slang. You can't really use slang in essays. And actually, some essays, it's okay to use contractions like can't, don't, uh, won't, things like that. But research papers, absolutely never use contractions for research papers or any standardized testing essays that you write. So Sebastian, if you go and you have to write an essay for the GRE, please break up those contractions. Not that you use many contractions, but um, that's something to keep in mind too. Um, other casual, other ways I see casual speech entering into essay writing is the way that you write in text messages, the way that you write in like emails to your friends and stuff, messages on Facebook, that type of stuff. Um, you can't replace a word with a number. You can't replace a word with a single letter unless that word is spelled with that single letter. Um, so definitely don't do the casual stuff that you do with your friends um, through texting and stuff in formal essays. I have seen it, otherwise I wouldn't talk about it. And then another thing to keep in mind, another place that this comes from is um, just speaking generally. We will very often, uh, like I saw an essay even from this group that said, spoiler alert, spoiler alert in it. There's no reason to include that in an essay. And actually, if, if it were like a psychology essay that you're turning into a psychology professor, they're not going to appreciate that at all. An English professor, they might actually give you a little bit more leeway depending on how effectively you use it. But using that casual speech and writing, what it does is it actually damages your ethos or your authority in your writing. And it makes us not take as readers, as fish, it makes us not take our aquarium very seriously. It makes us not take the essay very seriously. And I'll go more into that as we talk about rhetoric. Um, but casual, write, at, casual speech in writing um, for your essays is definitely a no-no once you reach college. I see this a lot. I, don't, I haven't seen this in the essays so far um, that I've given feedback on, but I see this all the time in college level essays and even beyond that. But using terms like I think, I believe, according to myself, I don't know how else people say that because I don't really ever use that. Um, but that's implied. If you're writing the essay, we know you think that, <laughs> right? So leave it out. What it does is it actually causes your audience to question your ethos again. Do you have the authority to tell me to think this way? Because if you just think this, I can dismiss what you think. But if this is the fact, if this is the truth, then I can't just dismiss that so easily. If uh, X is wrong because of Y, then I can't really dismiss that. But if I think X is wrong because of Y, then you can dismiss that because that's my personal opinion. Um, and so just to maintain that level of authority, try to get out of the habit of doing things where you doubt yourself. This is doubting language. I think, or I believe, or maybe like get rid of that. Just state what you want to state. This is an American essay. We are Americans. We are rude. We say what we want to say. <laughs> just remember that that's appropriate in essay writing. Um, this is something that I get questions about a lot. Using first and second perspective in essays. Um, so just to clarify for the video, first perspective is using I, like so I, my, me, um, talking about me in my essay. Um, and second perspective in essays would be like you. So you go do this, when you do that, this happens, um, or even like I, I'm not exactly sure which perspective, probably a um, part of the second perspective, first perspective, um, including the we in all of that or our. Um, I see that in essays a lot. And it's not wrong. I'm going to say that it is not wrong to do that in essays. In high school, they do teach you not to use um, I in an essay or to talk to your audience directly, um, which would be the second perspective. But here's what it does for your um, essay. It actually, if you're using I in an essay, 
it can make it to where your audience feels disconnected with the argument that you're making. If you're using I because you're saying, I conducted a study and the, my subjects were talking about X, Y, and Z, which is why we need to do this. Um, that's more effective than saying, I went to school and they were unfair to me, so that's why we need to change the grading system in school. No one cares about your personal experience with that, unfortunately. That's, that's just the way we are in this society. Um, so the using first person perspective in that way is actually going to cause your audience to disconnect and question your ethos. And the second perspective, I see this actually a lot in college level essays, is using you. Um, you don't want to do this, you know, just the general you, not anyone specifically, but using you actually does refer directly to your reader. Um, and if you're referring directly to your reader, you're kind of telling them directly what to do. And some of us readers, we don't like to be told what to do. And obviously I'm one of those readers. You don't say, you need to do this if you're on our side. I'm going to be like, wait a minute, uh, uh, no, you're not telling me what to do. You need to convince me what to do. And so actually that causes me to remove myself from that essay. And I'm not the only person who reads like this either. Um, and so using first and second perspective in essays is okay, but you have to find a way to use it effectively. Um, and sometimes that just takes experience and experimenting around and seeing how your readers are going to respond. But those are a couple of reactions that you might get from readers is feeling a little bit disconnected or a little bit confronted with your argument if you use first and second perspective. So um, be aware of that, but also be aware that it's not wrong. To be verbs and passive voice. So be, been, were, was, is, we don't like those in essays. That creates a passive voice. And a really easy way to explain that is the difference between the phone is in the air versus the phone, uh, I guess that's a really bad one. The phone is on the hands or the phone sits on the hands. I didn't really know another verb, maybe flies in the air. Um, but we need two different verbs. We need an active verb and we need a passive verb. So the phone is on the hands is passive. The phone has no choice, right? But if the phone sits on the hands, the phone is actively choosing to sit on the hands or the phone is actively doing that thing. Passive voice makes it to where people can disconnect a little bit more from your argument. Um, to be verbs aren't illegal, but professors don't like to see them that often. And so for research papers for my class, I would limit them to five before I would start taking points off of essays, actually, because the passive voice would be so strong that their argument would no longer be effective if you use too many of those. Sometimes it's helpful to use to be verbs to correctly set up tense in your paragraphs. Um, but be aware that to be verbs can create that passive voice, which makes your argument more passive, which makes it less assertive, which makes it less powerful. So you need to make sure that your argument is um, going to be powerful. And if those to be verbs create that passive voice and that causes um, someone to disconnect from your argument, then um, that's not what you want. You want to try to revise that. Sentence variation. Usually people by their very nature will vary the lengths of their sentences, but sometimes I'll see essays with just one long sentence after another long sentence, especially if they're writing across languages where in the other language that is appropriate, um, but in English it isn't. And Spanish is a really good example of that because in Spanish, run-on sentences are absolutely appropriate. Um, I see the words and and that a lot in people who are writing in English, but usually speak Spanish. Um, and that's a run-on sentence usually. But you want a combination of both. Um, in English speakers, I actually see the opposite sometimes, where it's just too many short, short, short sentences, um, or too many short uh, phrases where it's just separated by a comma, um, which then creates another run-on. So vary your sentences. Sometimes you need to make a short point and sometimes you need to make a list of points and that's okay too. But we like to see sentence variation that actually can keep our attentions uh, on your essay, that can keep our attention span uh, on your aquarium, <laughs> on your essay. So sentence variation is an effective tool. Wordiness and word choice. Um, wordiness can cause your argument to be really confusing. 
Um, when you're speaking to people or if you're doing some creative writing, wordiness can be kind of fun. You can actually get really creative and have some fun with the words that you choose. Um, but wordiness, if you're writing an essay, sometimes people will choose to be wordy because they're trying to use big words, because they're trying to combine words in ways that they've heard their professors do or the maybe the author of the book we just read did. Um, but sometimes wordiness makes it to where I don't understand what you're talking about. Um, and then you'll need to go and reword it. Or maybe you'll use a word choice that um, maybe it was a little bit more of a risky choice. Um, maybe you're using it in a more metaphorical way, but your audience disconnects from it. That's where you really wanna pay attention to your reader. Figure out if your reader understands what you're saying. And when I go through and I cross out entire lines of text, a lot of the times I'm eliminating a couple of different things. I'm eliminating wordiness and I'm eliminating um, passive voice. I'm changing passive voice to active voice. Um, so some things to keep in mind as your readers are reading your essays, maybe ask them, are there any parts of my essay that are really wordy and difficult to understand? And are there any parts of my essay where my word choice is confusing? Um, that can actually help provide some insight into your essay and asking those questions helps your readers know what you're looking for because sometimes readers have a hard time giving feedback. They don't want to be mean. They want to support you, but they don't realize that it's actually helpful to get this feedback. Um, paragraphs, tense and paragraphs is something that I actually see confused a lot at the college level. Um, one thing to keep in mind is you want one tense per paragraph. That's a really easy rule, um, one tense per paragraph. Sometimes that can be kind of mixed up a little, especially if you're able to use passive voice effectively. If you have a paragraph that half of it needs to be in past tense and half of it needs to be in present tense, passive voice is actually a way that you can accomplish that without separating it into two separate paragraphs. Um, so you can be creative with that, but you basically an easy rule for paragraphs is for every time you switch tense, you switch paragraphs. Um, do not mix tense in your paragraphs. Um, some common grammar mistakes, I included that in there. Some common grammar mistakes uh, most often are like commas and semicolons. I see those mistakes a lot and actually those are learning mistakes. I'll see people using commas in incorrect places or not using commas where they should and usually you, you have to feel it out to figure out where the commas need to go. There are some rules associated with that and when it comes to writing sentences, if you have two complete ideas, then separate it with a comma and add a, uh, is it a conjunction? I think that's what they're called, like and, but, um, so, things like that. So like if I have a statement I like macaroni and cheese and I like hot dogs. I could just say, I like macaroni and cheese, comma, but I also like hot dogs. <laughs> um, so like those are two complete sentences, that's perfectly acceptable. I could also though, use a semicolon in that statement. I like macaroni and cheese, semicolon I like hot dogs. Um, even though those are, those are two, com two complete separate sentences, I want to show that they're connected somehow because maybe I like macaroni and cheese with my hot dogs. Or that's probably a more effective way to say that. But um, you want to show a connection and maybe you're doing some poetry. Maybe you're doing creative writing. Shoving a semicolon in there is a really easy way to show a connection between two complete sentences, actually. Um, with both commas and semicolons, you want to make sure uh, that you have a subject and a verb on either side of the punctuation mark. Um, so that's actually the elements of a complete sentence, a subject and a verb. If you only have a verb, it's a fragment. If you only have a subject, it's a fragment. You need both for it to be a complete sentence and actually commas um, and semicolons are ways to connect things that you could have independent, um, but usually um, you want to show that they're connected in some way. That's also a way that you can effectively um, vary your sentence length and stuff like that. And one of the things that you'll probably notice I did in your essay, because I did this in all of the essays, um, was sometimes when there was a really long sentence, I would break it up using uh, periods or using commas. I may have even thrown a semicolon, although I did, don't think I did that this time. Um, but you'll, you'll find me helping you vary your, your sentence lengths and stuff like that based off of punctuation. And that's just to create, you know, a variation that makes it more interesting to read and a more powerful argument in the end. Um, are there any other grammar mistakes that actually either of you have questions about? <laughs> or grammar confusion might be a good one. 
Okay. So the last one I can think of is a uh, sentence structure. And as I mentioned, um, every sentence needs to have a subject and a predicate or a subject and a verb. Um, I'm mentioning this because when I, when I asked some friends of mine for feedback on some of the things that they needed help with as they were going through high school, from high school into college, um, they were people who didn't speak English as a first language and sentence structure was something that was a little bit more difficult for them to understand. Um, but understanding what makes a complete sentence actually can be really helpful when you're writing your essays, even if English is your first language. Because like I said, a lot of the times when we're reading writing, we're not reading correct writing. We're not reading writing that was written for the essay form. And so we might take some of those reading habits into our writing when we're writing essays. And that's something that you'll just want to make sure um, that if you like to read novels or if you like to just uh, make comments to your friends through a uh, messenger or something like that, that those habits don't come into your essay, that you're making sure every single one of your sentences has a subject and a predicate or an easy way, a noun, person, place, or thing, and a verb, an action word where something is happening. Everything needs to do something in a sentence. <laughs> Just remember that. Um, and those are like 10 common mistakes that I see um, coming from high school into college. Um, do you have any questions so far? Anything that you've encountered? Any feedback that I've given at any point that uh, you're wondering, where did this come from? All right. So the next thing I really want to talk about is rhetoric. And this is going to help with both writing and it's going to help with reading. And it's also going to help you as you learn how to learn in college. Um, so rhetoric is, well, what is rhetoric? Do you guys know what rhetoric is? Have you heard of the word before? Yeah? Well, rhetoric's actually really difficult to define. I didn't know what rhetoric was until I had to teach rhetoric. That's how I, how I didn't understand it. And it's not something that they just introduced to you in high school. But rhetoric may be defined as the faculty of discovering the possible means of persuasion in reference to any subject. That's Aristotle's like official definition of it. And actually, if you Google what is rhetoric, you're going to find a bunch of stuff where they're like, this is what rhetoric is. Article, 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 trying to explain what rhetoric is because it doesn't just have a simple definition. Um, but thinking about what Aristotle said, the way that I remember that is rhetoric is the art of persuasion. Um, so rhetoric refers to the way language is used to make an argument or to convince someone of something. So usually uh, rhetoric will create a rhetorical situation. Every time when you're using language, we, we create a rhetorical situation which relies on rhetorical appeals. So I'm talking to you right now and in order to convince you that I know this stuff is right, I'm actually using a lot of appeals right now and it's not even conscious. We do it every time we make an argument. Um, we create that situation and we use these appeals. These appeals are devices in rhetoric that are used to convince an audience to agree with the speaker or author. These are the specific things that we're doing to try to convince people. The official vocabulary, I'm going to introduce that to you as pathos, logos, and ethos, and they're always going to go in this order. You will hear about this in college, I don't know, possibly, I never heard about it at Evergreen. Um, but if you end up transferring schools to Mundo, you will hear this at other colleges. Um, and you may hear it at Evergreen. It's just that we don't teach rhetorical classes, um, or at least I didn't take rhetorical classes. That's probably a better way to phrase it. Um, so you're going to hear about pathos, logos, and ethos. For the sake of my class, I want you to forget those. <laughs> don't remember those. But remember the definitions. I wanted to show you the words so that you know that there are words associated with it. I'm going to share the slideshow with you so you have access to the uh, vocabulary terms in, a de in addition to their um, definitions. But I really want you to know what the definitions are. So uh, pathos is an attempt to incite an emotional response in an audience. Um, and I'll give you a couple of different examples of that, but one that immediately comes to mind is that Sarah McLaughlin commercial where they have the dogs that have been beat. You, do you know what I'm talking about, Mundo? 
the sad dog commercial. Yeah, these dogs that have been beat and abused, like somebody threw dirt on a dog or something, and then they filmed it, and they have that Sarah McLaughlin song playing. And it just makes you want to cry because all these poor puppies, they need a home, right? That commercial is using pathos, trying to get an emotional response out of us. Logos is the use of facts or information. It doesn't have to be factual. It just has to be information um, to convince an audience. So I can use a quote. I used that Aristotle quote to show I know what I'm talking about when it comes to rhetoric, even though I didn't know what it was until I had to teach it, right? <laughs> um, that's using information in order to show my audience that I, in fact, can, uh, should convince you of this argument because this information reinforces what I'm saying. Um, so use of facts or information to convince an audience. And ethos is the use of authority. Um, and this, this is kind of weird if you think about it in terms of just authority, but use of authority to persuade an audience can look like um, using my education. So I kept referring over and over again to this is what I got my degrees in. This is what I've been teaching. That's using my education to reinforce my authority or my ethos in this subject to convince you that I, in fact, am correct in saying this and you should trust what I have to say. I have a title that's associated with that or even um, thinking about like the principal at your school. If the principal at your school says something, then you believe it, right? Because they have that title or your professor. You don't question that because they're, they're your professor and they have that title. Um, another thing that you'll hear about, especially from older generations, is firsthand experience. They will rely on their firsthand experience to convince you because they're older and they've lived longer and you have to trust that because you weren't there in the 70s, right? Um, and so that's the use of any form of authority, any form of authority on a subject to persuade an audience to believe in the um, argument or to be convinced by the argument. So some more examples of that would be um, so pathos or use of emotion or appeal to emotion. You shouldn't eat veal because the baby cows that are butchered to make veal are inhumanely tortured prior to processing. I used several words in there that I didn't have to use to talk about what veal is and why you shouldn't eat it. But using the word butchered and inhumane and tortured and processing, those are all words we don't want to apply to a living thing. So that makes you feel a little bit worse about eating veal, right? According to the Department of Labor Statistics, the unemployment rate in Shelton rose from 6% in March of 2020 to 16% in April. That's true, by the way. Um, but that's using information um, or facts in order to convince you that what I have to say next or whatever my argument is about is important. So if I'm trying to convince you going to college is really important because according to the Department of Labor Statistics, the unemployment rate in Shelton rose from 6% in March of 2020 to 16% in April. And if you notice, this is a quote that I used in my graduation speech for your graduation because my need um, for you guys is I don't want you to lose sight of your goal of going to college. How can I convince you to trust in that argument or convince you that I'm right because of these statistics, because of this information, that's why you should believe me that college is important. Um, so that's the use of information. And I definitely use rhetoric all the time to convince people of things because that's what writers do. Um, and finally, the last one, uh, ethos, using authority to appeal to your audience. Dr. Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases warns the American public that if we return to work too soon, it could result in a sharp increase in COVID-19 cases. So I introduced Fauci as Dr. Fauci. I introduced his title as the director. I talked about where he works, which is the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And then I talk about medicine, right? So obviously this doctor guy who's leading this institute of research, that person has the authority to tell us that we should not be going outside and catching this virus. So that's using authority to convince an audience. Um, and we could easily just talking about any one of these things go on and actually have a deeper conversation about the very argument that's attempting to make um, using appeals going back and forth because that's the rhetorical situation that's been created. So those are some examples um, so that you can see how those are related or uh, how those are used. But what I want you to pay attention to is in the book that we're reading, how does Diaz use appeal to emotion? How does Diaz use uh, uh, information and facts? Um, and how does Diaz use uh, 
Cortez title or the king's title or God's title or the title of a Christian in order to convince his audience that who is reading the book that what they're doing is justified. Um, so pay attention to those things as you're reading. So I actually have a text that I'm working with to help define this um, for us. And so do either of you guys know what a fallacy is? Yeah, kinda. It's um, a lie, kind of a lie. Kind of, yeah. So, is it a, like a, the, oh, a go ahead. Based on false, is go ahead. a lie based on false fact? Kind of. Uh, a lie based on false fact is an example of a fallacy, yeah. But a fallacy overall is an argument that is flawed by its very nature or structure. And so we're going to look at a couple of different types of fallacies. You don't have to memorize these. I haven't memorized them, but I, once I talk about them, you might recognize how they've been used, especially nowadays when we have all this fake news and we have um, all this like political back and forth stuff going on. There are a lot of examples of fallacies in our current, like just you can look at your headlines and, and see examples of fallacies probably. Um, so fallacies of emotional argument are uh, scare tactics, which are um, common ranging from ads for life insurance to threats of audits from the Internal Revenue Service, politicians, advertisers, public figures, sometimes peddle their ideas by scaring people and exaggerating possible dangers. So you'll notice that this happens in the news all the time where they're like, if this doesn't happen, then your kids are gonna die. Um, they do, there actually used to be a commercial that would come on around 10 p.m on a uh, regular TV that said, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your kids are? <laughs> and that's just a scare tactic because uh, it was the middle of the war on drugs, right? Um, either or choices. So this is actually one that I do with you guys all of the time with the Upward Bound students. And uh, Mundo, don't tell the other kids I do this because I don't want them to figure this out. But if I want to uh, get you guys to agree with something that I want you to do, I will give you two choices. I can make it, you either do this or you do that. Um, and it makes it seem like you have the agency to make a choice there, but really you're doing two things, one of two things that I want you to do, right? That's actually a fallacy. And uh, that's very effective uh, with working with children or working with students um, because you do eventually need them to do what you want them to do and using those choices can be helpful, but it's inherently flawed. If you were to question it at all and be like, wait a minute, I don't want to do either of those things. I want to stay home and sleep. What am I going to do about it, right? So that's a fallacy. That's an either or choice. Um, and a lot of the times, uh, relationships, that's how a relationship can go sour is giving those ultimatums to your partner, right? Let me see. There's a slippery slope argument. Um, those slippery slope fallacies describe an argument that portrays today's tiny misstep as tomorrow's slide into disaster. So if we don't stop kids from using marijuana tomorrow, they're all going to be doing coke, right? Um, so that's the slippery slope argument. Um, the sentimental appeals, I gave an example of sentimental appeals when I talked about the Sarah McLaughlin commercial. It's like an overuse of um, appeal to emotion. So arguments that use tender emotions excessively to distract um, the audience from facts. So like uh, the dog commercial is just trying to make us feel bad so that we will go and adopt dogs. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes there are other ways that um, marketing does this. A really good example is fashion magazines and the fashion industry will uh, try to make us jealous, which is an emotional response and make us feel bad so that we'll go out and buy their products. And then we'll be, you know, as long as we consume these products, then we're more likely to work ourselves up to try to be like them, right? But ultimately it's a losing battle because every time we'll see more and more commercials making us feel bad. That's a form of sentimental appeals as well. Um, and then bandwagon appeals are arguments that urge people to follow the same path as everyone else. And we see this um, now with the election stuff going on. Like you can, we can see both the either or choices or the bandwagon appeals. You can either vote Republican or Democrat, which actually those are not the only two choices. And usually that means that you're getting on a bandwagon with one of those parties. And so um, it's flawed. The very idea of it is flawed um, because it's a fallacy. Fallacies of logical argument um, start out with like hasty generalizations, which um, cause, let's see here. 
they're an inference drawn from insufficient evidence. So like the example that this text that I'm looking at gives is because my Honda broke down, then all Hondas must be junk. And actually this is something that people use with race a lot. This is something that I keep hearing about with uh, people who are against the Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of people will say, well, if they didn't just, if they didn't make the cops mad, then they wouldn't be killing them. And that's really a hasty generalization. That's a huge generalization about an entire population of both uh, a racial demographic and cops. <laughs> so like, uh, it's not right to take that generalization either direction. Uh, faulty causality. Um, so that is basically a cause and effect thing. So after this, therefore, because of this, um, it's a little bit weird, the translation of it. So let me see if I can find a good, good way of explaining that. Um, it's the fallacious assumption that because one event or action follows another, the first causes the second. So a lot of the times what we'll see is um, people will make connections between things that aren't necessarily um, definitively connected. So it's not like this thing caused that thing. You can't make that connection without a little bit more work. And usually you'll see statistics doing that. Um, so begging the question has to do with actually ethos a little bit, um, but it is, it is based off of logos, um, the logical argument. So this is where, um, I guess an example would be like, you can't give me a C in this course, I'm an A student. So based off of an understanding of someone, um, we, we question uh, whether or not we should trust our instincts. So, like uh, another example would be like, representative um, X can't be guilty of accepting bribes. She's an honest person. Um, so just because you know that they're an honest person doesn't mean that they're, they don't do dishonest things, right? And so that's a fallacy begging the question. Um, equivocation is, um, this one's a really, there it is, is an argument that gives a lie that gives a lie an honest appearance. So it's like a half truth. Um, this is one that I actually hadn't heard of before, um, but this is an example that they use Macbeth, they use Macbeth to demonstrate. Um, I'm trying to find a good way to explain this. So equivocations are usually juvenile tricks of language. Um, consider the plagiarist who copies a paper word for word and then declares um, that they wrote the entire paper themselves. So that, that's a good um, example of the equivocation thing. Um, I actually had a hard time with that because I don't hear about that one as much. Um, this one we hear about a lot, the non sequitur. I have to admit Crystal. The non sequitur, which claims reasons or warrants fail to connect logically. Um, one point doesn't logically follow another point. Um, so you don't love me or you'd buy me that bicycle. So another one of those abusive relationship fallacies, right? Um, and then we have these, oh, there are a couple more. They're straw man and the faulty analogy. The straw man fallacy um, attacks an argument that isn't really there. And so um, an example of that I'm trying to find the example in this book. So it says the speaker or writer sets up a straw man in this way to create an argument that's easy to knock down or proceeds to do so. So um, if we set up the other person to where we know what they're going to say and they make an argument um, and we just basically attack them from there. Perhaps that's the straw man. I don't have a strong, um, I actually don't have a strong connection to that one either. These ones are a little bit, um, a little bit less ingrained in my mind. Um, but the last one is the faulty analogy. And obviously that's gonna be a comparison between things um, that actually, don't compare at all. So 
Like, here's an example that this text gives. Regardless of how hard she tries, Britney's not Madonna. So why would we compare Britney and Madonna? That's not relevant. And the whole argument is going to be faulty in and of itself. So that's probably also the, who is, who's going to win a race, Batman or Superman, right? <laughs> that's a really faulty argument because we can't effectively argue it. Um, and then we have, I got to click on this again. We have fallacies of ethical arguments, which actually are a little bit shorter. So appeals of false authority. So um, drawing on the authority of widely respected people, institutions, and texts. So if I said Fauci wouldn't agree with that, then that's my use of, or that's a fallacy in my use of his authority to prove my point, which might not actually be true. That That's a very false, um, it's a very poor way to phrase that argument. Um, Dogmatism is the next one. So a writer who asserts or assumes that a particular position is the only one that is conceivably acceptable within a given community. Um, so that one you'll see actually a lot at Evergreen. Um, that's the one where you have to agree with them or you're a bad person, right? And so that one's a fallacy in and of itself. And that's something that if you can recognize it's a fallacy in the moment, then you can call it out as a fallacy and you can poke holes in their argument, right? Um, but that's something where everybody just assumes that everyone's going to agree about the same um, idea and maybe not everybody in the classroom does. Ad hominem arguments, um, which are the last one, are attacks directed at the character of a person rather than at the claims he or she makes. So we see this in politics a lot where a politician will put out an ad where they're directly attacking their opponents. Um, and that's, that's really common and that's a fallacy also. Um, so what I wanted to do now was I wanted you guys to look at these headlines. I just literally took a screenshot yesterday of the feed on my phone. Um, so we have several different headlines here. We start off with Kanye West breaks ranks with Trump, vows to win US presidential race, according to Forbes. So what appeals can we identify just in the headline alone and maybe even looking at the picture because rhetoric actually isn't just, isn't just language actually. Like I said, it's hard to really define what rhetoric is, but it's the use of images in combination with this. Like if I had a really evil text and that's how I decided to type up the headline, then that's going to say something. Uh, maybe you're going to think, oh, Kanye is a vampire if I read this, right? Um, so right here. What rhetorical appeals? Appeals to emotion, um, appeal to authority, or appeal to um, information, use of information to appeal to an audience? What do you see in Kanye West breaks rigs with Trump vows to win US presidential race? What do you think, Crystal? Authority, he's like, what's good? The guy on the bottom, they're all like messed up, you know, their faces, they look aggressive or like, you know, you know what I mean? Mm hmm And Forbes, you can see Forbes is at the end there. So why are we citing Forbes when this is a U.S. News and World Report? Because Forbes has authority on economics and some authority on politics too, right? So yeah, there's definitely an appeal to authority there. Um, anything else that you can see? Usually it's not just one right answer for anyone. What other appeals might be in this one? especially like looking at some of the pictures too. Crystal pointed out, they kind of look bad. They look grumpy. So like Kanye's up there. Maybe, go ahead, go ahead, Mundo. Maybe emotion because lots of people don't like Trump. Yeah, a lot, of, like yeah a lot of people don't like Trump. Um, probably my news feed is also going to guess what I like based off of where I've been, who I've been around, the things that I buy, the things that I read, you know, and so they might be assuming that about me as well. But as we can see, Kanye's wearing the MAGA hat. Kanye is in the middle of speaking, which we don't know what he's saying, but it looks like he's not happy about it. Um, and a lot of people really don't like Kanye. <laughs> in addition to not liking Trump, a lot of people don't like Kanye. A lot of people think, even though like they like him as an artist, they think he's kind of crazy as a person. And so definitely we have some appeal to emotion where maybe the headline is trying to incite us to get angry that Kanye West is trying to run for president um, because we see him in a, the middle of speaking to someone. It kind of looks like he's being defensive just in the way that he's postured there and he's got the MAGA hat on. Um, we see that it's Forbes magazine reporting this so we know it's a reputable site so we can trust that. Um, and so it, it is trying to appeal to a few of those different things. Um, what about the next one, the one with uh, Zuckerberg 
pursing his lips like that. Facebook ad boycott organizers meet or uh, met with Zuck Zuckerberg. It didn't go well. <laughs> that was hard to read. He looks pissed. He looks like he's been attacked. Well, if you were just to look at the picture, it looks like he's being attacked or he's like ready to go off on you, you know? Mm hmm. You can but, see his vein. Go ahead. Yeah, he just looks disgruntled. I was thinking that it could also be, um, you know, a rhetorical fallacy because um, mm -hmm. we don't really know. I mean, I can have that face too, and I don't necessarily have to be uh, like being like that's my face when I being boycott by an organizer. You know, that's that not necessarily has to be that. Yeah, I was thinking of your fallacy. face looks like that, Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but nobody's don't need to boycotting me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that that is a good point like maybe he's just biting his lip and they caught him in a still frame on zoom how often have i frozen in this like weird like facial yeah. expression that i have right um so maybe they just got him at a bad moment <laughs> but uh yeah it looks like according to the headline we have something controversial happening. I don't know what the Facebook ad was. I didn't know that uh, there's a boycott. Maybe Facebook's boycotting the ad. Maybe the advertisers are boycotting Facebook. I actually don't know what's going on there. Um, I know somebody organized it and that they're probably enemies with Zuckerberg, according to this headline. And who does it look like it didn't go well for? It looks like it didn't go well for Zuckerberg, right? <laughs> because he's the one making the grumpy face there. So we don't actually know the outcome of that. I don't even know what's going on. What didn't go well? What could possibly go badly? Um, but we have it starting out with the words civil rights and active activist groups. And it's looking like it didn't go well for Zuckerberg. So maybe this is a step in the right direction for civil rights. And maybe we can assume that based off of this uh, headline that we're seeing. They're trying to get us to assume things about this. They're trying to get us to assume that this did not go well for Zuckerberg, which might make us emotional if we side with Zuckerberg, if we're against Zuckerberg. We have one or the other choice, right? Um, that's the fallacy that we're working with here. Um, and it didn't go well definitely appeals to emotions right there. That's, that's actually an opinion. Um, and so just placing it in a headline means that we're going to be looking at this with an angle from the very beginning. Um, so yeah, th those things are definitely present now. That's a really tense one. Um, as coronavirus cases top 3 million, Fauci warns against misreading a falling death rate. What about this one? It's all fake. It's all fake? Well, it's the New York Times. That's a very reputable resource. You're both in there. What is it? Can you hear that? Oh, do I sound like an alien? Yeah, okay. No, as Corona cases top three million. Who's Fossey? Um, he's kind of the medical authority who has been um kind of combating with Trump. I guess that's the way the news has been presenting it. Anyway, oh. uh where he's the guy telling us to stay home and Trump is telling us to go back uh to work and stuff. So yeah, he's I the, mean if Fossey is that famous, then that means that I mean we're all falling for something. Well, then what are they using here to try to get us to Fauci? Uh, this article? Yeah, they're using Fauci, Fauci or Fauci as, as the person um, and the coronavirus, like coronavirus cases as like an outlet-ish or something, like as the main thing. Um, what do you mean on the, about that? Well, like Fauci is the person, like if you read LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, you're going to like obviously start reading it, but coronavirus. So the 3 million, I mean, I guess that's just a percentage for people to like, to know more about like the death rates, you know, that's like the information provided. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's actually a good point. They're using information. They're using facts and information to try to draw us into the article. Um, we have numbers here. Most of the time people don't like to argue with numbers. Um, numbers are really strong, really effective to use in terms of making an argument, um, but they're also really easy to poke holes in, especially if they're um, statistics. Statistics is actually, if you talk to English, the English world people, like the English majors and stuff, statistics are, are not 
real math. They're not effective. It's actually, it is, it is effective math. It is real and actually needs statistics in order to understand like other forms of physics. Um, but we see numbers here. We see 3 million. We see the word coronavirus. We see falling death rate. The word rate, virus, and 3 million are all facts. They're all number-based things. They're all informational. It's hard to argue with that. But then, as you mentioned, we see Fauci or Fauci, whatever his name is. Um, and so we're also relying a little bit on his authority telling us this information. So we're using facts and authority in order to appeal to the audience and get the audience to read this. So they want to know where all these millions of cases are coming from. What did Fauci say against this? How many people actually aren't dying now compared to what they were? We're wanting to read information through this article. And how about the last one? A list of people and things Donald Trump tried to get canceled before he railed against cancel culture with that really angry finger picture. <laughs> what appeals is, is coming across really uh, boldly in this headline? Well, how about the picture? The picture before it and the headline before it was not even a picture. It was just the New York Times coronavirus live updates. So that's very fact-based. That's very informational. What about the picture below it of Trump? It's for Mundo's turn. <laughs> well, what do you think? I spoke. Oh, which picture? The Trump one on the bottom, right? Yep. Uh, let's see if you... I'm not sure. So how does uh, Trump look there? Uh, kind of. <laughs> uh, he looks. Can't really tell. Um, Are you able to see it? Yeah, I zoomed in. I'm not sure. He looks like he's confident, kind of. Yeah, authority. So yeah. Be, well, he looks like he has a lot of authority, but he looks, he looks like, like a meme. Lot... Yeah, maybe he looks like a meme, but there's a reason that he's in this position and he is with this article. This isn't an accident. This is very intentional on the journalist's part. Trump looks mad. You notice that? He looks like he's yelling at somebody. He's pointing his finger up. He looks mad. And then we have as our headline, a list of people and things Donald Trump tried to get canceled before he railed against cancel. I don't even know what that means. I don't, like, I'm guessing shows. I don't Could know. I thought CNN was with, like, was CNN not part of, like, Donald Trump's whole campaign, or was there another one? Well, I, I'm not exactly sure. I don't really know the details of that, um, but I know that a lot of a lot of people pit media outlets against um, political figures, especially, um, more like liberal or more conservative either direction they tend to pit them against figures themselves that headline sounds kind of ironic though it does <laughs> kind of sound i think that's the point that they're trying to make is that he's a hypocrite that's what they're trying to say like he's canceling people but he is against canceling you know that's part of what they're doing um, he looks angry there. He's got the finger up, he, like he's going to point it in your face, like he's going to get in your face and fight with you. And they're talking about a list of things, people and things, I don't know what that means, that Donald Trump tried to get canceled. What's another way to say get canceled? Donald Trump tried to screw over? <laughs> so, I mean, they're definitely saying something definitive with this headline, and it doesn't seem like they're on Trump's side. <laughs> They're going to give us a list of things. That's like top 10 things to buy this summer, right? They're giving us a list of people and things that Donald Trump has tried to cancel. And they're saying, but he's being a hypocrite. He uh, is against canceling culture. And they're showing him angry. They're trying to make a controversy out of that situation. And actually, news outlets do this all the time. News outlets try to act like um, a situation is much bigger than it actually is. We can see that there's a lot of emotion in just the headline alone. And we don't like hypocrites. American culture, we do not promote being a hypocrite. We don't want people to say one thing and do 
another or tell me not to do something and then go in behind my back and do it. That's actually part of why we're so upset with the police right now is because the police went out and started hurting innocent people from all different sides of the spectrum. Um, and they weren't getting policed about it. They weren't actually being monitored. And why can't we go out there and hurt people? If you're going out there and hurt people, or if we can't go out there and hurt people, why are you going out there and hurting people? It's that sort of thing. We don't like hypocrites in our culture. And so if we point out that any figurehead, we could even switch that picture out, switch that picture and name out for the Zuckerberg one and say a list of people and things Zuckerberg tried to get canceled before he railed against cancel culture. And that same image would do the exact same effect. If we just flip flopped those pictures, <laughs> right? It's gonna elicit the same type of emotion. And so this one's definitely trying to appeal to emotion. And a list makes it seem like they have information um, that's going to reinforce that. So they're appealing to um, logos, or they're using logos, and they're using um, uh, pathos, the appeal to emotion, um, appeal to, to logic and appeal to emotion. So we can see that with that one. And actually, that's a really good example because we see headlines like that all the time, and they really are interchangeable. You really could cut and paste Zuckerberg into that, and it would try to elicit the same type of response. Um, any questions about, about how rhetoric works or any ways that you've seen it in your lives? Can you think of an example of um, an appeal to emotion? The cancer videos, like all the time on, like on TV, where it's like it plays that sad music. It's like you can see a patient at any time, and they show like people with bald heads and like dying and all that kind of thing, you know? Yeah, and they're trying to get you to feel bad so that you'll give them money. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, I'm not a, saying it's about a cause. I'm just saying it's like. Well, that that's a you kind of caught the lecture toward the end, but that's uh, what we were talking about with sentimental uh, fallacy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But what about you, Mundo? Can you think of an example of an appeal to, actually, can you think of an example of an appeal to authority? Me or who? Uh, Mundo. Um, not really at the moment, but Okay. I can see if, like, someone, like a celebrity, tweeted something out about something, everyone would believe it because they're in an authoritative position. Oh, yeah. Madison Beer. Uh, what did Madison Beer do? Madison Beer went to protest for the Black Lives Matter, but she took pictures, like, borrowing someone's sign. And she got so much hate because of it, because people thought she was doing it for social media. Mm. But like, it's like the Black Lives Matter. She was trying to promote it, but yeah, it's pretty much promoting Black Lives Matter, taking cool pictures and posting them on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. And so holding a sign that's associated with a specific movement um, definitely like aligns you to that movement, right? And if you're, especially if you're with leaders from that movement, um, but even just being a celebrity and like, actually a really good example is Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio is really against climate change um, and wants people to stop eating cows. Like he really does not want people eating cows because uh, cows actually contribute really largely to the depletion of our ozone layer because we have these huge farms where there all those cows are farting and all of that methane is rising and getting kind of trapped in our atmosphere and actually um, damaging our, our climate, right? Um, and so, we have DiCaprio telling us to do these things. If we're obsessed with DiCaprio, if you grew up with, in the age of Titanic, like a lot of people my age, they might be like, oh my God, Leo's doing this, so I need to stop eating cows. And that's definitely an appeal to authority, right? What about uh, logic, an appeal to logic? So use of information, use of facts, stuff like that to try to convince us. Can you guys think of an example? And that's any one of you. Can you repeat that, please? So the use of uh, information in order to uh, convince an audience. Uh, 
We have something going on right now that only happens every four years. Every four, every four years? years? Oh, that's the Olympics? Well, I guess that happens every four years too, but I was talking about the election. <laughs> I was going to talk about the eclipse. When does that happen? Every 120 years? <laughs> well, um, the eclipse, so yeah, I mean, that has some boating. information involved with it too. <laughs> Is it boating every four years? Yeah, so elections. And okay. so a lot of the times people will use information like, uh, here's what our society is like right now. Here's what our city is like right now. If you vote for this person, this is how our city is going to change, right? Um, and a lot of times they'll use statistics in order to prove those different things. And so if you're like, well, I want to vote for the winner, you can like pay attention to uh, preliminary um, surveys and stuff like that that news stations will do. And um, you can kind of get an idea, oh, well, I think this candidate's going to win, or I think this candidate's going to win, and you're relying heavily on that information that a news source is telling to you, and actually statistics are re really easy to manipulate. It's really easy to say, this percentage of people did this, but you could mean this percentage of people in this area, and of people, we mean like five people, you know, because actually, here's a really good way that I manipulated statistics. Reagan? Huh? Reagan's? I'm not sure what that means. Reagan's campaigning. Oh, Reagan's campaigning. So all, mm -hmm. a lot of campaigns will use that type of stuff. Um, he was, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Reagan was a celebrity, uh, knew how to work that type of stuff, right? Um, oh, what was the point that I was going to make now? I think I lost my trail thinking about Reagan. <laughs> um, oh, I remember the statistics that the ways that I man manipulate statistics, right? So if I want to show your high school that Upward Bound is really, really successful at getting kids to go to college, I can talk about the uh, class of 2019, because we actually had 100% of that class get accepted into college. That makes Upward Bound sound great. 2019, 100% of our graduating seniors got accepted into college. How many seniors did Upward Bound have that year? 24. Wasn't there like three? Six. <laughs> there were six seniors. And all of the seniors got accepted to college, but I didn't finish that sentence. Not all of them went to college. <laughs> so see how I manipulated that? People do that all the time with statistics, and that's just a form of rhetoric. What about now? Are you guys like... Due to COVID, are you guys like not expected to have like a percentage or are you guys laid off? Nationally speaking, um, 10 to 15% of students are dropping out of college. And my guess is that those statistics apply to this uh, graduating group as well. Like 10 to 15% probably won't make it to college. Um, what we're finding with Upward Bound is that it's really difficult to get um, accept, acceptance and financial aid information or confirmation for that type of stuff right now. And if it were more reliable, we might be able to keep people's eye on their goal of going to college. But what's happening is that colleges are working from home. They're kind of not working. Like they're, they're putting a pause on things or taking their time with things, but the military's not. Um, like trades are hiring like crazy because construction, a lot of construction people have been laid off you know, people are dying of this virus. So jobs are opening up. I mean, there's still a high unemployment rate. Um, but that's sometimes a little bit more appealing if you're coming out of college out of high school, and you don't know that college is there for sure. And so we have seen a bit of a bigger drop off this year than we ever have with upward bound in the past. But also your demographics being um, in a rural community where um, you don't necessarily need to go to college to be as successful within your community, your immediate community. Um, sometimes it's hard to see how necessary college actually is because um, unemployment really isn't affecting as many educated people as it is uneducated people. Um, but are you guys like, are you still like expected to like have a certain percentage or was that like where you guys already canceled that for this 2020 class year? We don't have a choice. Um, we are expected to get a certain number of you, a certain percentage of you to go to college. And it's not even just your graduating class. It's your graduating cohort. So anybody at any point who's ever joined our Upward Bound program and we spent money on them, those students also have to go to college. So it's those students are also involved in that count. 
Um, so like the students that you haven't seen in a while, unless they dropped out of high school, if they graduated high school, they're part of the cohort and they, they'll count for our numbers. So we wow. have to follow up with everybody. And in addition to that, we have to get you to graduate from college. Um, but that's also a way that I, I talk about numbers too, because we had one class, our class of 2012, when I was running the Clover Park in Tacoma program, where we actually had 75% of that class, maybe even 80%, I don't know. Uh, it was between 75 and 80% of the students graduate from college on time within six years. And that's something that we definitely brag about. But do you think we say the class of 2012 did this well and then we don't talk about anything else? No, we just say upward bound gets statistics like this. Dang, <laughs> you know? Class of 2020, 25%, I'm guessing. Not going to lie. Mm. It's, it's definitely higher than that in terms of okay. enrolling for the fall. Um, I would say we might have had maybe... And actually, that's not even accurate. I can't say that we've had a huge drop off because actually a backup plan is to get people to go to SPSCC. Oh, so, okay. um, those kids that I don't lose to the military or <laughs> don't answer their phone. Um, okay. But yeah, so we're still stuck with our statistics, but that's how we, we do make a difference. Actually, our statistics do make a difference and I'm able to talk about those, but I can also manipulate those if we didn't do quite as well as we did in other years. And that's just to show you, not to show you upward bound maybe manipulates our numbers, um, but it's to show you how you can use rhetoric in order to convince your audience because ultimately um, our program does what we're supposed to do. Um, we help people go, even people, if they don't go immediately to college, they'll go a few years later. But I need your school to understand how successful our program is, even when I can't show them the numbers of how much confidence we give you guys, of how many um, soft skills we give you guys. I can't show them those numbers. So I have to rely on whatever numbers I can show them. And so if I have to take out the year 2012 that it happened and I just talk about Upward Bound does this, or if I say, we send schools to Columbia, to Stanford, to UW. That's not untrue, but maybe in our entire history, we've sent one student to Brown or we've sent one student to Stanford, right? Um, but we can still brag that we've sent you to those schools. And that's just a use of logos. That's just the way that I'm trying to use information to appeal to you guys or to your school. It's mostly um, with like your school and um, parents and stuff that will will play with numbers like that. Um, with you guys, it's you guys get to see more of a soft thing. We'll use pathos a little bit more. We'll try to um, talk to you guys about how much confidence you're going to get, how empowered you're going to get about your culture. But we'll also use logos like that uh, six percent unemployment rate in March to 16 percent in April of 2020. That's a real statistic and I did talk about that in my grad my speech for your guys' graduation celebration because it's really important that you don't lose sight of college as a goal. Um, so I'm using that information in order to convince you guys but if I really want to get to your hearts I can talk about well think about what your family sacrificed for you to get to where you are today, for you to have these opportunities. What are you gonna give back to your family for everything that they've done to you or for you? That's appeal to emotion, that's appeal to pathos. And a lot of people really value their family and how they feel and want them to be proud, right? And so it's not wrong to use information in order to convince your audience of your points. Um, I don't know if I had any other slides, it's just questions. Um, it's not wrong to use your information in order to convince your audience. Just make sure that you create an argument that is powerful, that people can't poke holes in. And obviously if it's a fallacy, people are going to be able to probably poke holes in your argument and your argument, if they prove that it's wrong, they're not going to be convinced by it. Um, so you wanna make sure that you use rhetoric in order to be more powerful, in order to do what you're going to do more effectively, right, in terms of your writing. So well, this we do on the 20 something of this month. Uh, this actually in and of itself isn't an assignment, but I did go over the assignment. Um, we have, I think it's the one that you were just referring to that's actually due on the 20 something of this month. So this one. Um, I think the due date, yeah, right there. Final draft, uh, July 27th by 11.59 p.m. Actually, there's one due at 11.59 tonight as well, and that's the final draft of your inquiry one. Speaking of which, uh, Mundo, are you ready for me to grade your, I, I realize we're working on Google Docs, so I haven't seen if you made changes. Not yet, I have to make the revisions. 
Okay, cool. Um, so text me once you're ready. Basically, I will take a text from you to count as um, you're turning it in, your final draft, um, since you already shared that document with me. Um, and Crystal, if you're able to, if you can meet with Sebastian and work to put your first essay together, um, that's due by midnight tonight. And if uh, you and Sebastian work thoroughly enough, um, then I'm assuming that you can produce a draft that's good enough that I can count it as a final draft. Um, but that means that you need to work together or have him give you some feedback, um, some detailed okay. feedback that you're going through. So um, that's something that maybe you can um, make an appointment with him. And um, if you need an extension, then I need you to request it um, through email. So if you send me an email and ask for an extension, just let me know when you want to turn it in. Um, but yeah, this one is the research paper. I need three total sources um, for you to use, including the book that we are reading for the class. And what you're going to do is tell me um, what you think is the main reason for uh, Mexico's defeat. And so all of this information, I shared this with everybody in the class. Oh, and this will help with your annotated bibliography, which is due on Monday. This is the citationmachine.net. Uh, That's going to help you create a works cited page. Um, and since we're doing an annotated bibliography, if you don't know how to um, list your sources out or cite your sources according to that really complicated MLA format, then just go to this and plug it in and it'll create the citation for you. I think there's also a way to do that through Word if you um, wanna just do it with Microsoft Word and that'll create a citation for you. Um, the reason I turn to the citation machine is because it updates since it's a website, it updates with the latest MLA format. And so um, that's going to definitely give the accurate um, way to do it according to the latest Purdue OWL uh, standards. So. Um, yeah, that's some information on that essay. I hope that answers your questions, um, Crystal, because we've had a couple of essays and this is the one that's due on the 27th. I don't know if she's there anymore. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Oh, you are there. Do you have any other questions? No. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just, uh, I don't know how to work this. <laughs> oh, it's all right. Um, yeah, you have the mute things down in the corner, the mute microphone and stop video. And so um, pay attention to whether or not those are clicked. Sometimes they'll click themselves if you have issues with your Zoom. I can see you, but it's like, yeah, a little square. Oh, yeah. I yeah, that happens. <laughs> you are literally a square. Can you see my camera? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Look at, can you see that? Oh, yes. you clicked out. So if you go to the corner... There should be, like, if you hover your mouse over the corner of it, there should be, like, a pop-out button. And I can't show you on mine, because even if I share my screen, I can't show you. Oh, it. yeah. Whew. Okay, found it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm a little, I see myself. I'm a little square. <laughs> you are, too. <laughs> Wait, um, I don't think I have a back camera. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a back camera. Oh, I see. Um. So any questions about rhetoric or um, how to compose an essay? I think you missed that part, Crystal, but I will share the, um, not only will I post the video, but I will also share the slideshow with you guys so that you have a copy of it and you can refer to it anytime you want to. And I will also share the SAT um, thing that I, I brought up earlier on how to use your thesis statement to create, uh, to create an outline for an essay. Um, that was designed to teach students how to write an essay in 20 minutes. And so if you wanted to be able to do that, then um, you can use that to help you out. So I'll share all of that with you guys after this. Um, the next thing that we do need to focus on um, is the trial. And that's part of why I wanted to bring up um, rhetoric tonight so that we can think about the ways that people are phrasing things and how we can phrase things to convince our audience. Because what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to video um, I think that's going to be the most effective way to hold this trial is to hold uh, video testimonials through Zoom. Um, and we're going to need to actually uh, create those videos and use those to convince our jury, which are going to be your peers in the other program and people from Evergreen, um, that Cortez is either guilty or that Cortez is not guilty. And Mundo and I are on the defense team so far, and Sebastian, Crystal, and um, Lily, you're all on the prosecution team so far. So- but, um, what, like, what are we prosecuting him of? Like, 
So actually, I will share my screen again. Um, That's where I'm like kind of confused. Like in the book, does it talk about like what he's done wrong? Is that why we have to? It like, talks look? about what he's done, but we okay. have to determine whether or not it's wrong. And actually, it's your guys' job because you guys are the prosecutors. We have to defend him. <laughs> so we have to prove that he's doing something right. So on the. Um, I think on the syllabus, I pasted a link to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and I'm going to paste a link to the US Constitution as well. I want you guys to use these two documents as the laws for the basis of what you're, con what you're actually going to try to convict him of. Um, so as you can see, article number four, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Did Cortez try to take slaves? Hmm? Someone answer. <laughs> 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 well, the yes, answer he is did. Yes. yes, he did. Yes, he did take a few slaves, right? So already he's violated Article Number Four of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations. So that's that one before, thing, that, right? Huh? Was that before? Was he even alive by then? No, he wasn't. See, that's the trick. Is back then there were actually different values. There were different. Uh, I don't even think people thought of human rights. I don't think that phrase existed back then um, because people didn't really have human rights back then. People were pillaging and, and raping and all that sort of stuff back in those the 1500s. I mean, it was like the dark ages. <laughs> um, so we're going to use something that was developed much later. This was developed in the 20th century. And actually, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. You can see uh, right there. Eleanor Roosevelt, who's a former first lady, um, was married to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the president um, who brought us out of the depression and um, was the president during World War II and pretty much brought us out of World War II before he died. He served three terms, but his wife was a huge um, advocate for human rights. And she actually helped to compose the Declaration of Human Rights. She's an amazing woman. Um, and so we're going to use this to determine whether or not Cortez violated human rights. Because if you read the book, um, if you actually subscribe to some of the ideas that the Inquisition had, like maybe you do think that people who don't believe uh, the tenets of Christianity or Catholicism um, should be taken into slavery or servitude or something like that. Um, this document is to show that the world agrees that these are what everybody has the right to. And so I want you to, now that we're in the 21st century, to use this 20th century document that people finally compiled after generations and generations of inhuman behavior um, in order to convince us whether or not, if we subscribe to some of those other ideas, um, whether or not Cortez is actually, in fact, guilty of violating human rights. We will also have the Constitution on there, and that's probably going to be more useful for Mundo and myself to pros or to defend uh, Cortez as you're trying to prosecute him, because obviously there are going to be quite a few things that the Inquisition violated in this Declaration of Human Rights. We see that the world through that lens nowadays. The Human Rights um, Declaration is something that we're all pretty much... Um, we see the world through this. So like if we scroll through it, um, everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. Um, like people should be able to get together and protest or get together and have fun or whatever. Um, you know, this is something that if, if at any point um, Cortez said that no, the natives couldn't do that, we now recognize that that's a human right, a uni universal human right that everyone around the world should have. And so it's helpful for us to identify the ways that we've violated in this in the past, because in the book, uh, Bernal Diaz does not think that we have violated human rights. Bernal Diaz thinks that we're helping the natives and the Mexicans. Um, so using these rights that we use nowadays to see the world, um, that's going to help us recognize some of the atrocities that we've committed. In addition to that, um, there are a couple of other things that are going to help you with. You guys do need to know how the court procedures work. It's helpful for you to know the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the U.S. Constitution just going through college, just knowing these things and knowing how to write or compose an argument that's convincing enough to defend or prosecute somebody of things that they were never found guilty of that they did out in the open, right? And that people accepted and that people even to this day, if they read that book and decide that uh, Bernal Diaz has some authority, may agree that um, 
no, these are good things that that uh, Cortez did. And so we need to sh we need to work to try to form those arguments and practice that type of thing. I hope that answers your question. I think I, I rambled on and I'm a little wordy. So yeah, I I'm, well, I honestly didn't mind whether I was like in the prosecuting or like either or sides. Mm -hmm. like, I believe you can gather both like from enough evidence to like support yourself. So that's what I try to mean. Try to yeah. 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 And actually being prosecuting him, like I can see like lots of things that'll be easy to cite in order to prosecute him. Um, but we're going to need to know on the defense side what you're accusing him of. And so what we need to do, and I'm not exactly sure, I wanted to spend some time doing that, but we did end up talking about the lecture a little bit long and we're already over time now. Um, so we need to get together and talk about this. So um, maybe during the day tomorrow, Mundo, um, would you be able to meet with me on a Zoom meeting and we can talk about our strategies for defense? Um, maybe we can try to anticipate some of the things that they're going to accuse Cortez of. And maybe Sebastian, you and Crystal um, and Lily can plan a time to all meet together tomorrow and come up with the things that you want to accuse Cortez of. And that's what you're going to have to use to compose your opening remarks. And whoever is the lawyer, um, you need to work with that lawyer in order to compose those opening remarks. And we'll also need to determine what witnesses we're going to call to the stand. And so you guys as the prosecution, you guys are the ones who make sort of the initial, like I wanna call this witness to uh, show that they're guilty, this witness, this witness, this witness. Um, and they're all gonna be characters from the book. And Mundo, you and I will do the same thing. We'll come up with witnesses that we think will be um, convincing. And remember to use those rhetorical appeals to try to convince your audience um, who are the jury that Cortez is not guilty or that Cortez is guilty of these different things. Um, appeal to their emotions, appeal to their logic. This is a jury that actually doesn't doesn't know the story, they didn't read the book. And so um, it's like they've been sequestered and they're going to be asked to vote at the um, end of summer celebration on whether or not, based on the arguments that we've presented, Cortez is guilty or innocent. Who are we gonna be presenting this in front of? Um, well, I don't know that we'll actually be able to hold a trial, so we're going to have to film um, oh, and okay. take Whew. place before the last day. But what we're going to film is we're gonna film opening remarks, witness testimonies and um, any any uh, cross-examination that we might need to do. So all of this stuff needs to start happening soon if we have to do it this way. Um, we would have a little bit more time to prepare uh, if we're going to just do a live trial, but it's looking like that's not gonna be a possibility with how everyone's schedules are working out. And so we just need to meet in our small groups and actually film our testimonials and stuff. And so I'll, I'll let you and Sebastian like maybe text an email um, at, along with uh, and actually, Crystal, if you could give him a, a good email or a good text, whatever you want to receive your information, if you could put that in the chat. And Mundo, is it all right if I just text you to try to arrange? Okay, cool. Um, and so we'll just arrange a time either tomorrow or whenever works for you guys to start working this stuff out. And if we can start doing testimonials as soon as possible, that's gonna be helpful. However, we're dependent on you guys. And so what I would like to do, I'm gonna create a Google Doc and I'll create a prosecution uh, section and we'll have a defense section. We'll list our witnesses there. You list your witnesses there. You list the articles he's violated there and we'll, we'll proceed with our defense based off of the articles that you list. Does that sound good? All right, awesome. So keep an eye out uh, for Sebastian to reach out to you. If you have time tonight, Crystal, I encourage you to work with Sebastian to complete that first essay so you can at least get in the practice of trying to catch up if you fall behind for college. Um, you're going to have a lot of classes at Wazoo. It's going to be a little different for you than the Evergreen students since you have multiple classes at the same time that you're going to be juggling. And so if you fall behind in your English 101 class, which is probably the first one you're going to be placed in unless you test out of it, um, practicing catching up can be helpful and communicating with your professors is another thing you'll need to do. So if you can't get that essay done tonight in final draft form, then send me an email or a message or something and let me know when to expect it because that's going to be helpful. And remember, the annotated bibliography is due on Monday, which is just works cited with a summary of what you're going to be uh, using that for, what the text is and what you're using it for. So is that helpful? 
All right, cool. Any questions before I stop the recording that uh, other students might want to hear? All right, cool. I'm going to stop the recording.